Let's talk some more about small swords. Hey folks, how are you doing? It's a nice sunny day here. I hope you're having a good time wherever you are. So let's talk a little bit more about small swords. So we've spoken in the past about the so-called Kolishmard small sword, which is this type of small sword here. I've actually shown this example before. I've got another one up on the wall here, slightly different proportions. This one's got a more ornate hilt much more ornate health in fact. This is probably a military um, one for an officer being a completely steel hilt and fairly utilitarian uh, plane. Um, there's a little bit of decoration um, engraving in this case on the Kulishmard part of the blade. You won't be able to, I won't move the um, blade closer because you won't be able to see it unfortunately in this light. Um, but um, it's a fairly utilitarian piece. And we've spoken about um, how Kulishmards possibly are a militarized or a more military uh, applicable type of small sword. So in first thing to say, of course, I've said this before, but for those of you who haven't necessarily seen the previous videos, small swords, specialized um, thrusting sword, sometimes viewed as a dueling sword, although it certainly wasn't only used as a dueling sword in the 18th century. Um, small swords developed out of the rapier, but are very different to rapiers. They're much shorter, much lighter. Um, rapiers, generally speaking, rapiers of the, of the height of the rapier, should we say, around the year 1600, either side of that, um, are much longer and much heavier. They're as heavy as a medieval arming sword, usually about um, two and a half to three pounds in weight, sometimes even more, um, and have very long blades. Um, very, very different weapons to small swords. Small swords did come out of rapiers and there's a weapon that kind of the missing link between them uh, which is sometimes known as the transitional rapier and that is essentially a late form of rapier which has uh, hilt forms which you can see are moving towards the classic shape of the small sword hilt and uh, the blades get shorter and lighter and more generally speaking more specialized to the thrust rapiers of the 16th and early 17th century can cut and thrust they're cut and thrust blades although they're the weight is more shifted towards thrusting than cutting, but they can nevertheless cut. Small swords, for the most part, with a few rare exceptions, cannot cut. The classic French small sword blade is triangular. When I say French small sword blade, that's because it seems to have been a French invention, not because they're all French. The small swords, I think, have got kind of short shrift in uh, modern swordsmanship in that they've often been the butt of jokes and people have often um, because I guess of the similarity between small sword fencing and foil fencing, which modern foil fencing evolved out of um, 19th century foil fencing, which was the practice for the use of the small sword. And I guess partly because of that, uh, and perhaps because the small sword looks very dainty and light, lots of people make fun of it. But it is a serious weapon. Um, and you know I, know, I know people who can use small swords extremely effectively against other people who are using sabers or backswords or whatever. Now, don't let, <laughs> don't let, uh, don't think for a second that I would necessarily choose personally a small sword in, uh, uh, for a 18th or 19th century battlefield. I personally wouldn't. I would choose a backsword or a saber because I think they're more versatile against more types of opponents. But in a one-on-one -on -one situation, um, so in a duel basically, but even on the battlefield, um, the small sword does have some virtues. It's incredibly quick, incredibly light, and the thrust, because of the nature of the blade, it is extremely stiff. That is me flexing this blade fairly hard, and you see it does not flex much at all. That means, so when you push a point into something, the flex in the blade essentially steals um, energy from the penetrative force of the thrust. And as regular viewers of this channel know, I love deep penetration. But if you, it's quite seriously, if you want to run someone through, then the stiffer the blade, the better. Um, and small swords are very, very good at that. Now let's remember for a second that you know cut versus thrust was a massive debate in the 18th versus 19th century. Um, and whilst uh, a cut and thrust sword is, generally speaking, I would argue, more versatile. Um, the thrust, nevertheless, if you do get the thrust in, if you manage to cross, cross someone's cut um, and then run them through with the point, um, they're probably completely screwed in the 18th or 19th century because medically there's basically nothing Unless they're, unless they're really lucky and the thrust doesn't hit any organs, but if it hits an internal organ or a windpipe or a brain, um, you know, 
or heart obviously, but if it hits any internal organs, you are screwed. There's basically, unless you're the luckiest person alive, there's basically nothing that medical science of that time can do to help you. Cuts, completely different. Cuts were very often medically treated and very often survivable. They may put you out of action, so the cut may achieve its military objective by incapacitating an opponent, but the survival rate from cuts was very, very high. And, uh, Donald McBain, a famous swordsman and uh, pimp, as it happens, um, was, and I believe soldier at one point, um, he talks about swords and he rates the small sword really, really highly, despite the fact that he fights with lots of different types of swords, spadroons and back swords and all sorts. He rates the small sword really highly and he talks about um, taking cuts and basically just getting over it, get over yourself. Um, taking cuts and them you know, being healed up or cuts not getting through clothing, very important things to think of as well. Um, very often when we think of cuts, we think of cuts always being successful, but cuts have a much higher failure rate. If you push your point into someone wearing clothes, it's gonna go through. If you cut someone wearing clothes, it might not go through. Um, so um, thrusts, whilst they can be higher risk in fencing terms, they can leave you more exposed. And they run more risk of, for a second, being in the person's body before you can extract the sword out to defend yourself with. If that point goes into the opponent's body, they have a far higher rate of killing that opponent. Um, so small swords are in their own right very dangerous weapons and shouldn't really be laughed at. There's nothing really to laugh at about them. They're a murderous spike. Now, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. I'm not going to waffle on for too long because there are more things to say about this that I'll do in future videos. Um, but Kolishmards, we have talked about Kolishmards and why they may have potentially had that blade shape. Um, and the assumption that lots of people make is that the broader base of the blade is for opposing or parrying things like backswords and broadswords of the time. I have always been dubious about that. It could be true, it could be the case, but then why are they so finely edged if that is the case? I think there's lots of reasons why I think that's probably not the case. Um, I think the fine edges of the Kulishmad suggest that it is not for parrying, in fact. It is um, presumably because they wanted a wider base of the blade for some reason. And one possible reason is actually so that when you're encountering another small sword blade, it means that the bind uh, brings their blade further away from your hand and wider from the bind. That's one possible reason. Or it's possible that I'm completely wrong and it was for parrying back swords and broadswords. As far as I'm aware, no period source tells us what this Kolishmad broader section is for. If anybody out there knows better on that topic, I would genuinely love to know. And I'm always happy to be proved wrong. If I say something that I'm wrong about, I will issue a correction. My gut instinct, based on knowing about swords and based on other designs of swords that have regions of the blade that are designed for parrying, is that this isn't for uh, parrying against cuts of sabres and backswords and broadswords. But, as I say, I might be wrong. Now, an important thing to say at this juncture, and the reason I'm filming this video is because I've acquired another small sword. That's right, I've got three small swords. What's happening to my life? I don't know. Um, I'm actually probably going to sell this one um, because who needs three small swords? <laughs> I know there'll be small swords out there going, well, I, we need 50 small swords, but I'm not a massive small sword fan. Um, I like having a couple of small swords around for doing videos for you guys, partly. Um, also, they're quite nice to wave around. They're quite good at closing doors with, I've discovered, and picking things up off the floor. But um, <laughs> they're quite nice things to wave around in the house, and you're less likely to smash a light than you are with a sabre. Uh, yeah, my lights are still okay. But here is the other small sword. Now, a lot of people have said, so what, you know, why did people have small sword blades that weren't Kolishmard? If Kolishmard blades were better, then why have small swords that weren't Kolishmard blades? Well, isn't that a good question? And I don't fully know the answer. I can hazard some guesses, and that's what I'm going to do here. So, standard small swords look like this. Essentially, the blade is like an epée, like a modern fencing epée. And for that reason, people who practice small sword fencing these days tend not to use foil blades, they tend to use epée blades. Which I always found slightly funny, because historically, small sworders trained with foil blades. So, the, the straining weapon for the small sword is a foil, but modern small sworders use an epée blade. It's, it's kind of a paradox. I don't personally have a problem with it and I use epée blades myself because they feel nicer because you've got a better sense of edge alignment and everything else. But anyway, um, 
the uh, typical small saw blade is triangular and uh, hollow ground, very light and more like an epo blade, um, but sharp of course. Um, and it doesn't have this flared base of the blade or fort uh, uh, at the base there near the hilt. Um, it, it's narrow. Now why, if these were around and these were better, then why would you have these? Well, I think the simple answer is these aren't necessarily better. I think there's a particular reason why some people liked Kulishmard blades and lots of other people didn't like Kulishmard blades and they went with these sorts of blades. In terms of handling and holding the two, I've got to say, um, you can feel, although it's a very light weapon, this is, I think, I weighed this, I can't remember what it was, it's very light, it's like four or five hundred grams, very light. Um, although it's very, very light, you can feel that mass in the blade here. Um, with this sword, you don't. You can feel that that mass isn't there in the blade. So the blade, despite the fact this is a longer blade, this is a 32 inch blade and this is a 28 inch or 28 and a half inch blade. Um, so I've got extra reach with this and yet the blade feels somehow more nimble. Um, so Kodishmar blades are beefy. Uh, for some reason they wanted a beefier blade um, that sometimes had to sacrifice length in order to keep the weight down. Personally, I have to say, if I was just about to have a duel right now, or this afternoon, I would probably choose the longer blade because, as I've said in so many of my videos, having a few inches longer than, a, than, your, um, than your competitor is, you know, it's a big advantage. It's a great advantage, especially when you're striking with the point. In some ways, it's perhaps even more of an advantage with thrust weapons than it is with, uh, with cutting weapons. Um, but the other reason, and this is why I'm, this is the point I'm working around to, the other reason why I don't think the Kolishmad is like the military version of the small sword is that this is a military small sword. How do I know that? I hear you cry. Well, this is quite a special thing, and I didn't realise it was quite a special thing until it came to me. I, um, uh, I, I won it in an auction and um, so I, I hadn't seen it up close until it came to me and I was really surprised when it arrived because it's very different to all the other small swords I've ever owned. Firstly, the reason that I know it's a military small sword is because it's got military markings on the blade. Um, it's got um, gilt, so it's got engraved decoration up the blade and then gilding laid on and you won't be able to see, I shouldn't think, I can attempt to get my face out of the way and see if it will focus. No, it's not going to... Oh, maybe if I catch the light. Okay, there we go. There. I don't know how clearly you'll be able to see what that is, but that is a crown. Not only is it a crown, it is a British crown. With a sunburst above it, as I, um, as any antique sword collector or a British antique sword collector will recognise, it's a crown with a sunburst above and underneath the initials G.R. George Rex. Okay, so this is a Georgian military because only military swords have that marking on, and you find it on sabres, um, you find it on, um, I don't have an example here actually, but I ha you find it on Napoleonic era sabres. That is a Napoleonic era British officer's um, engraving, essentially. So this, almost certainly, was carried by a British officer during the Napoleonic era. Could possibly be earlier than Napoleonic era, it could be kind of American War of Independence, that kind of time, but we're looking at probably between 1760 and 1800 I suppose at the latest I mean it could even be later than that but if I was to if I was to guess when it dates from I'd guess about 1790 something like that um, but there is another reason that this is marked out as a military small sword that I personally have never seen before but bear in mind I'm not a small sword expert it has an entirely steel hilt, a very, very robust form. So if we look at most small swords, they're really quite flimsy. The knuckle bow is quite thin, the um, um, shell guard, double shell guard is usually quite thin. Although this example is probably also military the, and entirely made of steel, the, um, the hilt parts, except for the grip of course. Um, the they're quite dainty, they're quite thin. This example isn't at all. The, the bar of the knuckle bow is wrought iron and twisted. The pommel is really solid and beefy. The uh, finger rings are really substantial, but most notable of all, this bolster in here, um, which gives you the space to be able to stick your finger in there, should you want to, um, and the guard are really thick, um, very, very substantial, um, uh, wrought iron essentially. 
Um, so this, one of my criticisms of the small sword in the past has always been that the hilts are very fragile and that if someone's attacking you with something like a hanger or a backsword and you're parrying, if you get hit on the hilt, quite often I think that it would blast, I think that one, it would blast straight through that knuckle bow. I think I could cut through that knuckle bow with a sabre right now if I wanted to. I'm not going to do it, but. Um, whereas this one, I absolutely couldn't cut through. It's a solid iron bar, and all of this is really, really solid. And not only that, but even the wrapping of the grip is really substantial copper twisted wire. So the entire small sword seems to have been built with r robustness and strength in mind, and yet, it's not a Kolishmad. So there we go, I'll probably talk some more about all of these swords um, uh, in the future, but this, to my mind, is one of the other things to refute the fact that Kolishmads are the military version of a small sword. I don't think that's the case. Definitely, this is an example of a small sword which is not a Kolishmad, which absolutely, unquestionably, was made for a military officer, British officer, probably in the Napoleonic era. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.